My name is Jack Hardings and I'm a, a program lead at the ODI. Um, and we've heard a lot at the summit so far about the need to involve people in, in decisions about how data is collected, used and shared or stewarded. And so for the past year or two at the ODI, we've been exploring this concept of bottom up or participatory data stewardship, where we as individuals or as groups are empowered to, to steward data about ourselves or our communities or our local spaces. And you may have come across some of these approaches before, so things like personal data stores or data cooperatives or unions or data trusts, to give a few examples. But why are these approaches so important? What are they designed to address? And um, where are we in terms of their progress and where are they going next? To discuss this, I'm really pleased to have three people with us who are really leading the charge in terms of imagining and bringing about these exciting new forms of, of data stewardship. So we have Dr. Christina Kolkoff from the Why Not Lab, which among other things has developed WeClock, which is a tracking tool that enables workers to collect and make use of data about their well-being and experiences at work. Also really pleased to have Jess Montgomery from the Data Trusts Initiative at the University of Cambridge, which is really driving the development of data trusts as a new way for people to manage data about themselves. And lastly, it's great to have Dr. Kai Quick and the Amy from, with, with us from the My Data community, which is, which is a home to a real variety of these different initiatives um, and a community that I've personally learnt um, a lot from about human-centric data governance in the past. So I have some questions to, to start us off and, and to get us going, but also we'll have some time for any questions that you have in the audience. So please do ask them in the chat and they'll work their way towards me, I'm, I'm sure. So that's enough from me for now. Christina, I'm, I'm going to go to you first and would love for you to tell us a bit more about your work with WeClock, um, but also why it's so important that we create these new approaches to involving people in collecting, sharing and using data um, about themselves. Thanks, uh, Jack. Um, so WeClock, just, just so we get it right, WeClock is an open source app that you can download on Android and, and iOS. What it is, though, is that the data never leaves the user's phone unless they choose it to. So we as the developers, we don't have a backdoor entry to that data. We don't collect it unless they ask us to help them with the data analysis or so. But WeClock was really aimed at, and I think, you know, when we talk about data collectives, data trusts, we also have to take some steps back and say, why? Why should, in my case, workers be engaged in this? And we did that with WeClock. And what we found is this push-pull effect around the need to break the monopolization of truth, as I call it, as those who hoard the data, also those who control the narrative about work. So we need to somehow break that. But we also found a total across the board, really general lack of awareness from the side of the workers around data and around the role this has in our workplaces. So part of the whole sort of week clock story has been to build the capacity of individual workers to understand this thing around uh, data extraction, their data rights. And then when that is in place, begin to see, well, through using WeClock, how could the collective benefit from collectivizing, so to speak, the data? So, so this has been a really interesting journey where I think we, from the beginning, overestimated the digital maturity, so to speak, or the data maturity or data awareness of the ordinary worker out there. But how we now can see by the unions who are using WeClock can begin to see that this is being integrated more into their campaigning, their work, and the whole idea of breaking again this monopolization of truth. Thanks, Christina. I'd love to pick that, that topic of, of, of data literacy and understanding up um, in, in, a, in a short while, actually. And Kai, picking up from, from Christina, um, how, how does this and perhaps some of the other, other approaches you see in the, in the my data world, um, how do they differ from the ways that data is typically collected, used and shared? So how, how do these human centric participatory approaches differ from the status quo in, in your view? Uh, yeah, he hello, and I'm glad to be part of the panel. And uh, so my data community 
is now uh, established around my data global, which is uh, functioning on many levels of human centric personal data management. But I personally represent my data operators, which is uh, which is a thematic group under my data global. And currently we have uh, around 25, 28 uh, operators nominated. And we have actually ongoing award process, which will be published uh, in a couple of weeks in Amsterdam, like what are the this year's my data operators. Uh, but within the group of this organization who are already developed a service for being a data intermediary or this kind of data trust for enabling uh, human-centric da data management or human-centric uh, data use. We are trying to find a sort of uh, common practices and interoperability and this way establish the whole practices in not through single project or single uh, capability, but as a community of organizations and, and a more of sort of generally known uh, practices. And some of those companies have personal data storage. Some of them are just focused on uh, sort of consenting features. Some actually provide interfaces for managing, uh, collecting your own data through your like self-locking devices, or, or then some are having interfaces for creating zero-party data, sort of somehow curating your own data. But uh, all of these different levels, they, they sort of feed uh, into each other, and it's it's a matter of critical mass on how the, these kind of uh, data practices ultimately fall, uh, start to uh, create more value and become more established. And, and instead of just trying to develop one program, we try to sort of help programs to create that critical mass together. Uh, when it comes to sort of human-centric personal data management, I think that the sort of core points there are that uh, data is still very much in silos, especially personal data for, for good reasons and, and not that good reasons. But I, we, we believe in my data that individual is the key in unlocking that data and enabling data use across sectors. And also there are certain cases, let's say behavioral data, which often is not really uh, useful and practical if you look only uh, what single organization can collect. But it's only through individual where you can have a more holistic view on the data, what, what individual is and how they are behaving. So we are trying to enable that, but do that in an interoperable uh, and, uh, and transparent and really human setting and privacy preserving ways. Great, thank you, Kai. And Jess, over to you in terms of the, the underlying issues or, or challenges that are really driving your work on, on data trusts at the Data Trust Initiative. What types of things are you, are you trying to address and trying to fix? Thanks, Jack. Um, so our team at Cambridge is really interested in the application of AI to real world challenges and what levers we have to shape the development of AI technology is for broad social benefit. And one of the things that's become very clear over the last five years is that data governance and data stewardship is a really important territory in which we'll negotiate or navigate the values and interests that we want to embed in the development of AI technologies. And that framing, um, that, that thinking frames our work on the Data Trust Initiative. So we know from almost a decade now of public dialogue work that uh, people have aspirations for how their data should be used. People can see potential benefits for our shared health and prosperity, but people are also increasingly aware of how those benefits and risks are distributed across society and who bears the costs of data use. Um, and so we know the types of questions people ask are, for what purpose is my data being used? Who benefits from this and how can I play a role in, in shaping how my data is used and how technologies affect me? But then if we look at the wider digi digital landscape, we see that the, the types of power imbalances that are embedded in our relationships don't lend themselves towards providing levers for individuals and communities to play an active role in determining how their data is used and how technology affects them. So in our work, we talk a lot about democratizing data use and empowering people with the, the tools or rights they need to be able to, to assert themselves and to exert their agency in the digital environment. That's fundamentally about bridging this gap between the aspirations we have 
for, for our data enabled society and the concerns we have about the vulnerabilities that data use can create. And, and that's where data trusts come in, or that's where we think data trusts come in as a, as a tool to help correct some of those power asymmetries and to give citizens more of a voice in discussions about data use. Perfect, thank you, Jess. And, and actually, I might jump straight back to you in terms of um, with, with data trusts, um, I'm sure um, uh, people in the audience would love to know a bit more about where we are with them and their development, and, and particularly with the initiative and, and, and the work that's been doing recently, um, where you see data trusts as being um, and, and the progress made on them so far. Sure. So um, I'm sure I'm sure I don't have to tell the audience for this event that there's been an explosion of interests in, in data trusts in the last few years. Um, so we've seen a lot of interest in the concept, a lot of conversations about the potential of data trusts. And I think what we've seen is this growing community that's now coalesc coalescing around the idea that data trusts can play a particular role in data stewardship by enabling this bottom up engagement that we're interested in. So from the data trust initiative perspective, we think that particularly important features of data trusts relate to um, enabling collective action, uh, providing institutional safeguards and providing a vehicle for independent stewardship of data use. And we like to think we're seeing the community begin to, to develop consensus around this type of vision. Of course, the challenge now is to translate that consensus, that interest into practical action and move these conversations from theory to practice. So that's the focus of a lot of our work. Um, we know that in some cases that practical action first needs further research to fill gaps in our knowledge base. And that might be around some of the core concepts, some questions about what legal frameworks might work, um, the, the development of use cases, and for our part at the initiative, we're funding seven really interesting projects at this interface of theory and practice that's investigating some of these questions about what would go into creating use cases, what types of technical infrastructures are necessary, what type of legal and regulatory frameworks are relevant. But really the next phase of work needs to take that further and we need to really start growing the practitioner community creating pilot projects in this area. Um, so as a first step in this we're really keen to learn from the experiences of that community about what works in terms of operational strategies for data trusts, really tackling those issues like what technologies do we need? What business models work to make these financially sustainable? What forms of engagement between citizens and data trusts can really help bring that bottom-up empowerment? Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing some work that I know, Jack, you've been working on with the ODI and APSTE Institute coming out next week about what those operational strategies look like and the diversity of practices that people working in the community are developing. Um, but we're also seeing from, from our perspective that there's a great demand for support to help get pilot projects off the ground. And I think it's a really important question in developing this field, what type of support, mentoring, um, policy frameworks will help the practitioner practitioners that want to set up pilot projects serve their communities. Thanks, Jess. Lots of exciting stuff, and, and I'm, I'm hoping we can um, drop some of the links to, to the initiative and, and that funding program into the into the chat um, in, in Hopin as well, as I'm sure people will be interested to, to have a look. Um, from, a, from an ODI perspective, one of the things that we, we've tried to do with our work on, on these bottom-up approaches is to um, work on some of these newer initiatives and newer types of approach, such as data trusts, but also try to recognise the initiatives that um, are out there living and breathing um, already um, and things that can be learned from and applied elsewhere. And so Christina, in, in, in that vein, I'd love to um, hear more about your journey with We Clock so far um, as an initiative that is out there that is working with, with workers, enabling them to, to, to take some more control over data about them. Um, what types of um, interactions are people having with that data? What, what types of impacts are you, are you beginning to see? Thanks. Before I answer, Jack, I'm going to be so, so cheeky and just comment on something Jess, say, Jess said, because just everything you've said is so really important. 
But what I think is still lacking is raising that general public awareness to the fact that they could be empowered or at least how valuable as, as you know, I usually use the metaphor of an egg, how their data should be treated like this fragile egg and how we can raise that public awareness because, you know, really we can't have participatory design in any ways unless people have agency and they they don't know what they don't know and the majority simply do not know about this whole uh, data and inferences and, and the benefits of collective data so just you know with, with that remark back back to we clock um so again an, an overestimation or a wrong estimation that we had when we developed we put was that the worker collectives be it trade unions or be it worker collectives of any kind that they actually had the capacity to deal with for example csv files because this is what we talk if you are running running a campaign on wage theft or on uh, working time or something and then the workers using WeClock can then decide to share their data through secure means or whatever means they choose. And then the receiver will receive all these CSV files. Now, the majority of unions or collectives we've worked with and supported along the way, they're like, now what? You know, and, and for us who work in this world, it's maybe hard to imagine how few organizations outside of of industry and business have access to data analysts or who have any experience in analyzing CSV files. So, you know, we've been helping them with that. We have some great uh, data activists around the world, trusted partners who, who we hook them up with so that they can work together beyond and outside of our involvement as the developers team. But we've also now taking it one step further and just actually submitted an application to hope to get some funding to build a, an API on WeClock. So to allow, let's say all workers, let's say all gig workers in London or all workers in an Amazon factory want to run a campaign, they can do that and then get automatic data insights from their group, from their campaign. So to build an API on decentralized web uh, to really, again, treat this data as something so delicate. We also are looking into making the data ephemeral um, so that it would disappear after quite a short amount of time. So, you know, I, I have to say I'm torn when we talk about data trusts and then the knowledge that data can be so misused as, as Jess, as you were also talking about, right? And how do we not feed into the commodification of work and workers and citizens, yet still responsibly gather some insights to really highlight the needs of that community, be it of workers or citizens in a village or whoever. And I, I really, you know, that discussion, I think we need to fine tune and we're trying to do that in the week of making the data ephemeral, uh, allowing access to the insights for a certain period of time before they dissolve to and, and have to be renewed. But um, it's been really interesting. We've had workers who have used WeClock to test working from home, how much work is creeping into their private lives. So we added a manual stop start function on the work. We've had uh, testing done, measuring how often workers were within six feet of one another during the COVID pandemic. Uh, we've had commute time analysis and whether workers were working whilst commuting to be used as a discussion around working time, et cetera. So, I mean, lots and lots of, of, of really funky bespoke cases coming up but we hope that the, it can be broadened if we automate, so to speak, the analysis of the data. Thanks, Christina. Great to hear about and kind of where you've got to and, and also kind of where, where next with we clock. And, and everyone's welcome to that metaphor of data as, as Fabergé egg. Um, that, that, that's a, a new one on me. Um, Kai, maybe to, to, to you next, I'm interested in um, kind of some of the approaches that you see within that my data community perhaps specifically with some of the operators that you're working with are there any approaches to 
participatory data stewardship that, that you're particularly fond of or excited by? And perhaps with Christina's um, kind of slight query in mind of, of, of how are these different from the status quo? How do they not just perpetuate kind of data being extracted about people? What, what are some of those approaches that excite you and really do look different to, to how things are, are done at the moment? Uh, well, I, uh, first of all, I think that uh, it's great to see the action taking place in so many levels at the moment. The, the past years have been really uh, progressive in many ways. And I think that uh, it would be unfair to focus on that, okay, the, the progress happening in this domain, but it's actually happening now on many, many, many different levels. In, in my data, we, we have, our logo is also sort of highlighting how the different domains of human life are entangled together around data and personal data. But actually what we see at the moment is also very much uh, domain specific uh, activities. So for example, how cities are uh, sort of reinventing the ways on, on developing cities and services with a my data approach is very fascinating. There are good progress in many European cities around that. Uh, also, what we now see is the sort of data spaces emerging in, in EU, EU where the interoperability between different actors in industry are facilitated with the sort of soft infrastructure where the my data operators also belong. So the sort of uh, these uh, you could call them projects or uh, sort of uh, MVP products which have been there already multiple years are now acknowledged by cities, acknowledged by EU, are becoming a sort of established concepts within the sort of uh, sort of big infra that is being developed around the digital Europe and, uh, and in digitalization. So that's definitely very exciting. Uh, what is uh, also very interesting is the new development of different kind of identity wallets and how you can really develop the sort of data management around those concepts. Uh, I've, I've personally witnessed and developed a program where we have been enabling people to consume their own uh, consumption data through a loyalty program and, uh, and we saw almost half a million users in 5.5 million population in Finland taking use of that application and really uh, have seen that as a baseline for many interesting applications in health and, and uh, uh, sort of sustainability. So, so I think that uh, uh, the development is happening in many levels, and also the people's literacy is changing in a ways. Like the, it's been like Christine and Jess have been bringing that out. We need data literacy, but I've seen already signs that okay, this is changing. We are taking progresses. So, so yeah, uh, I think that it's very complementary development at the moment, and exciting on many levels. Thank you, Kai, and, and, and would agree that, that cities and, and citizens' interactions um, with cities and the data generated about that um, and their control over it is a really interesting um, context or, or use case for these kinds of approaches too. That's something we, we, we've, we've definitely seen at ODI. So conscious of time, we have just under four, four minutes left. Um, one of the questions that we've received is about the recognition of these types of approaches by and policymakers and regulators. And so Jess, this is, is one that I'll come to you on perhaps. Um, uh, how, how would you describe kind of uh, policy interest in these types of approaches, particularly maybe in a UK context? So um, how do you expect policymakers and government officials to, to, to acknowledge, respond, support this, this field? Um, what would you expect or what would you like to see from, from them in this space? Thanks, Jack. So this question about what is government's role in this space is a live one, certainly in, in the UK and across the in most places across the world. And because this is an area that is in flux, that is moving at pace, there is a lot of uncertainty. So one way of approaching this question is what are the no regrets steps that government can take that are helpful under multiple future scenarios for the development and, and use of, of intermediaries like data trusts? 
And we're going to call back here to Christina's comment on awareness, because one no regret step, it seems to me, is starting to build that type of data literacy awareness capability so that people are more able to engage in conversations about data use and how it, how it affects them. Another no regret step comes to looking at data rights. We know that data rights are foundational to making any type of data trust work. So we should be looking at whether the data rights we have set out in law at the moment are sufficient, whether they're future proof and what type of changes we might need to really empower citizens. Then beyond that, one space we see a lot of governments looking at is the safeguards around data trusts and other data intermediaries. So if we are entrusting these bodies with stewarding data on our behalf, how do we make sure they're trustworthy? That might be around enforcing basic standards of competence or providing powers to intervene, but it's a fundamentally a question about how do we enable innovation and new uses of data while protecting people against the, the harms from data misuse or from the failure of some, some pilot initiatives. So there's, there's a whole range of different activities there, but I, I, I think I'd start from the, from the basic basis of what works in the multiple future scenarios for the future of our relationship with data. Thanks, Jess, and, and lots of things in there that we could um, uh, have a whole panel session on in, in, in itself, so, so maybe for next year. Um, I'd love to come to each of you just for kind of a closing thought in terms of um, where this field is going. So in, in a year's time, if we are to speak about this, maybe five years time, perhaps, let, let's do that. What, what would you like to be talking about in terms of these participatory bottom-up approaches to data stewardship? What would you like to be the picture then? If you could give me um, a closing sentence or two, that would be great. Um, and I'll come to you first, Christina. I would love to see numerous, numerous data trusts, small and large around community, communities, ideological lines, work, uh, that are really built around citizen involvement. And I hasten to add where data is not sold, that it is not so that your privacy can be sold for money. It is benefits of other kinds uh, than financial. Thanks, Christina. And to, to, to you, Kai. Yeah, I, uh, I think that there are multiple domains that, uh, that can benefit from personal data management a lot, but uh, I personally at the moment am uh, very intrigued by how we can solve that marketing domain, which is the very sort of visible side of how that data is being used, how personal data is being used. So as a sort of proof point on how human-centric approaches and participatory approaches can work, I would like to sort of solve the trust, trust problem that we have at the moment in, in marketing, because I think that still organizations and individuals benefit from personalization and, and use of data. Thank you. And, and, and lastly, to you, to you, Jess, for the, the final word. Plus one to what Christina said. Um, and as an enabler of that, I'd add that we need a, a sustainable ecosystem of mentoring and support. So we're lowering the barriers to entry for people who want to start setting up these data trusts and intermediaries, allowing that proliferation for different purposes and causes. Perfect. Um, and, and thank you all again for, for, for joining us. Real treat to, to be able to, to get you together. And, and thanks to everyone for, for, for joining and, and listening in.